Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. I had an offer from one of the producers and the directors to go to LA. And sadly at the time I was in a very, very violent relationship. And he prevented me from going, from doing that. And, you know, really any sort of good, happy point in my life while I was in that relationship, you know, he would try and taint with horror for me. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, Rachel K. Ruse's life has been quite a roller coaster ride up to this point, full of many peaks and valleys. In her young adult years, she survived numerous domestic violence homicide attempts by a violent partner and then later shared her story across Australia, including in Parliament. More recently, she's the recipient of the Actor 2022 Reg Grundy Award for her TV show pitch, Facing the Fear, and she's the founder of Fierce Productions. All this while being diagnosed with a neurological disability. Rachel will share part one of her amazing story today and how her faith is helping her navigate the ups and downs of life. She's chatting with Eric Scadabo. Rachel K. Ruse, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you with us. And where are you joining us from today? From Brisbane, Mianjin in Queensland. Okay, and I have to admit, it's hard for me to kind of get my head around all of the ups and downs in your life. One minute, I'm hearing about how you're walking the red carpet with your daughter to receive a prestigious award. And then another time, you're being told by a doctor that you have a neurological disorder. So quite the contrast, the ups and downs in your life. Yeah, it <laughs> it never stops, hey? It, it feels like there's been so much that's gone on, so much trauma and just layers and layers of uh, things that I get hit with. But then there's also the times where, you know, God moves mountains and has really, you know, given me some moments to pause and reflect upon and, and you know, opportunities and in turn... You know, I've met some really incredible people who have their own stories. So uh, I think we have to look for the, the blessings in it all. That's right. So through it all, God has really been leading and guiding you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, showing me through that many times there have been signs, you know, where I go, that's, that's got to be God. You know, his, his timing and his way, you know, it's never our own. <laughs> as yeah. much as we'd like to have control over it and, and say, I need this, and I need this to happen now. Uh, you know, God, you know, turns it all out and turns your test into a testimony. And, you know, sometimes it's not in the moment that you see what's going on. You, you, you know, you, you, you're on your knees going, God, why? Why me? Mm-hmm. Why me? Yeah. But, you know, later on down the track, you can see, okay, God's taking, you know, that trauma and that skill set and he's helping me to help other people. Mm-hmm. So, again, you know, a, a silver lining, another blessing. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of ups and downs in your story, so we better get right to it. Let's start in chronological order. I'm I'm just a simple-minded guy, and I'm trying to get my (laughs) head around all this, so let's just kind of go from where were you born? Yes, I was born uh, in Brisbane, in Mianjin, in uh, Queensland, Australia. Um, Look, I'm going to give my age away here. I was a very late 70s baby, so I I grew up in the 80s, you know, back when we could ride our bikes, you know, until we could smell dinner, you know, wafting down the street. <laughs> um, you know, you'd be out all day. You know, as kids, we got out and got sunshine and, you know, plenty of playing with, you know, the kids in, in the local suburb and, you know, you'd ride your bike to the shops and, mm-hmm. you know, get an ice cream. And, um, you know, I had a childhood where a lot of our neighbours had horses. Oh. Yeah, get to go and feed the horses and jump on them bareback, which was, you know, in hindsight as a mother now. <laughs> Sorry, that was, you know. Some really uncalculated risk taking, um, but you know we were kids. I mean, that's you know, and I had a lovely next door neighbour who taught me how to play the piano uh, as a young child, and and she loved to sing. And I'd go over there and watch you know black and white movies on a, on a Sunday, and you know that was my my safe place to go to her place, and she was like a grandmum to me. And you know, I, I just yeah, I grew up as the youngest of four, um, had some challenging times growing up, some trauma and and some dysfunction, you know. And I look back and I think you know. Um, being my generation now, you know, we talk a lot more about about trauma and mental health and addiction mm-hmm. and things. You know, back in those days, you know, it was uh, the face you put on on a Sunday at church. There was certainly, uh, you know, people didn't really know what was going on behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I certainly had, you know, parents uh, who worked very hard. My father worked very hard to provide for us children and, um, you know, went to good schools and got an education. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Now, was faith a part of your childhood growing up? 
Yeah, look, I was raised um, in a local Catholic church, so we go every Sunday to church, um, you know, and that was sort of pretty much everyone in your local community, in your local school, you know, was there. So you'd see the, the same sort of people every Sunday. You know, I had my, you know, my communion, my first communion, um, confirmation, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, went to Catholic primary schools, uh, went to Catholic high schools, uh, all girls high schools. And yeah, I mean, I boarded for one year when I was in early high school. Um, I had to go to boarding school because my father had a heart attack and a heart bypass. Oh. And yeah, so my parents changed me. <laughs> After my first year of school, changed me to another school, which was not great. But um, yeah, I boarded for a year. And, you know, so back then we had nuns. We still had a few old, you know, old nuns around the place. And, um, you know, so I had different, I, I guess, different women um, influence my life. And, you know, um, some for the good, some not for the, not very mm. good. You know, but yeah, I, I again, I was given you know um, great opportunities, and and you know worked in retail through high school, and you know went out got my own first job, and you know was very committed to um to earning you know my own income, and and you know left home at about sort of just after not long after high school, uh, I was about mm-hmm. seventeen. And what would you say was the lasting impact of the Catholic upbringing? Look, I think it established a foundation for mm-hmm. me. Obviously, you know, I had always had a Bible. I think that was lovely. And I had teachers who give us little prayer cards and, you know, we'd have religious instruction. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the school I went to, though, it was very much an imposed instruction. It was a teacher's opinions. We were taught not to question anything or ask. Mm. So I never kind of really understood God's word. It was kind of more, I think, I grew up with like reciting it, you know, rather mm-hmm. than actually knowing what I was saying. Um, there was nothing like sort of devotionals or... You know, you didn't have like Christian bookstores or, you know, um, Christian sort of TV or there, there was just not as much that we have today at our fingertips. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we certainly didn't have YouTube and Christian yeah. radio. Now, another theme of your childhood was music from a young age. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think my, when I was about three, one of my earliest memories was singing at a family function with my great aunt and she wow. had been an Yeah, and she was amazing and I just... Remember everybody smiling and clapping and thinking, oh, I just can make people happy through music. And I, I loved the feeling of her warmth that mm-hmm. she brought to that and her encouragement at such a young age. And and then, yeah, my next door neighbor teaching me how to play piano and, you know, telling me I had a beautiful voice. And and then, you know, my parents um, putting me into voice lessons. And um, I guess the, the issue for me was, you know, despite, you know, what other people would say, it just seemed that I was never good enough for my mm-hmm. parents you know, sort of that always find fault with anything I did. And so it was very difficult for my self-confidence performing. But I went ahead and, you know, I sang at weddings while still in high school and working. And um, I, you know, I went on to sing in the early, earliest parts of my career, you know, performing in in theatre and singing and um, at at events and functions and weddings. And I kind of was like the wedding singer. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Back in that day and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, very, very busy, which I'm very grateful for. And, and again, a, a lot of them were Catholic weddings and in churches. Um, there was only the very odd wedding that wasn't in a church back then. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, I, I found myself constantly around, you know, God and, and symbolism of, of Jesus on the cross, mm-hmm. you know, music and hymns. And, you know, gradually I sort of probably was gently exposed to, like, Christian music through a girl that I'd worked with um, when mm-hmm. I was probably in my early 20s. And so things, probably I think God was planting seeds all along the way, knowing that I needed mm-hmm. to have a relationship with him and I, I wasn't there yet. Mm-hmm. And so you went to school for formal yeah. training on singing? Yeah. Uh, so when I was in high school in year 12, I ended up going to the Queensland Conservatorium here in Brisbane. And I did just a year um, certificate in choral studies and my goal was to continue um, music, but life had other plans. Yes, well, that's what we want to talk about, those <laughs> other plans. But as I understand it, it looked very, very promising. You were even possibly going to get a role in a Disney film. Tell us about what led up to that. <laughs> yeah, so look, uh, that was probably my very early 20s. Um mm-hmm. And I'd been, you know, working, I worked when I left school, I worked in everything from admin and marketing for real estate to some of the top corporate firms mm-hmm. and, and corporates across, you know, like global names here in Brisbane and, yeah, did bars and clubs at night. So I was around very different groups of people um, mm-hmm. and, and I've seen it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and then I kept doing my singing on the, on the side, recording, writing, and then I actually went to support, um, I was doing some modelling and I went to support another girl from the agency she said, I'd like you to take me through this song. 
and I'm going to this audition. I, I, we had the same agent, but I wasn't sent to the audition. So I went just to accompany her and be her support and her coach. And then the casting agent uh, from Mullinars, which is a, a renowned Australian casting group, um, she came out and said to me, oh, you're here to audition too. And I said, well, no, I wasn't sent. And she said, who's your agent? And I told her. And she said, well, I want you to audition. And I said, oh. well, my friend just auditioned. I don't want to do the wrong thing by her. And she looked at me surprisingly and said, you've got one minute. And I said, okay. So I went and talked to my friend and said, look, you know, they want me to audition. I don't want to step on your toes. And and she was a bit hesitant. She went, okay, well, if they've asked you to, I guess you're better. And so I went and did the audition and, you know, no no prior preparation other than helping my friend through hers. And You know, this sounds right out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, I ended up getting a call from the agent who never sent me saying, congratulations, you got this role in, um, it was a Disney film uh, through Buena Vista and it was George wow. of the Jungle 2. So they'd done George Jungle 1 with Brenda Fraser and this was number two and they're filming it down the Gold Coast to make mm-hmm. it look like Las Vegas. And, uh, yeah, so I had a feature role in that and it was an amazing time on set, like just one of the best highlights of my life. So you you actually did it? Yeah, I did it. Yep, yep. It was so wonderful. you're in that movie? Yeah, I am. I, I think I saw that movie actually. <laughs> yeah, it's it's still streaming on Disney. <laughs> I don't know how long, much longer for, but, yeah. So that was exciting. Um, and then I had an offer uh from one of the producers and the directors to go to LA and sadly at the time I was in a very very uh, violent relationship Mm -hmm. and he prevented me from going from doing that and you know as hard as that was at the time and in reflection you know God had other plans and within a couple of years I was pregnant and had my my daughter so Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) so this is uh just the start of the roller coaster ride so you have the high of being in a a movie and then possibly going on to even more success in movies and then the low of being in a domestic violence relationship yeah even when I was on set um I look back at the photos of of me in the trailer and you know I was so happy and photos of me with the makeup people and you know the cast and and it was such a happy set to be on but mm-hmm. I had my violent partner you know ringing my phone off the hook and texting threats and you know I mean I wasn't with my phone most of the day we were on set but when I was back for breaks in the trailer you know I'd come back and my phone would just have all these messages and and um you know it really any sort of good happy point in my life while I was in that relationship you know he would try and taint you know, with with horror for me. You're listening to The Story. Our guest today is Rachel K. Roos, who's sharing her life journey and all the peaks and valleys that she's gone through. Sadly, as we just heard, Rachel is a survivor of severe domestic violence. Next, we'll hear more of her story and how she eventually calls out to God at a very low point. All that and more is coming up when we return. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax, and this is The Story. Our guest today is Rachel K. Roos, who's sharing the ups and downs of her life journey with us. As we heard before the break, she had the peak of getting a part in a movie while simultaneously having the low point of being in a domestic violence-filled relationship. And parents... Before we continue, I just want to let you know that this next part of our conversation is not appropriate for young listeners, as Rachel shares some of what she's gone through as a domestic violence survivor, which she sometimes shortens to just DV. Perpetrators just want the control and don't want to see you happy. They don't want you having contact with family or friends or having opportunities. Mm. Um, you know, certainly at the time we weren't we weren't living together. I mean, I had my own own place that I was renting, and you know, my plan was to sell up the very few assets that I had and items, and you know, and get on a plane and, and go to LA. You know, that that was a big opportunity, and that's what you know I dreamed about. So the good news is, you escaped from that highly mm. dysfunctional relationship, having mm. survived some homicidal attempts. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, God saved me from death many times. Um, he had thrown me out of a moving car. Um, I've oh. had, you know, been knocked unconscious that many times. Mm. Um, I'd, you know, 
my nose broken, my ribs broken, pretty much, uh, well, my jaw broken, that's still an ongoing issue. Um, you know, pretty much most most bones in my body, I've had sprains or, or breaks. Um, mm. So I'm sorry to hear this. Yeah, oh, look, I, if, I know it's confronting for people to hear, but, you know, I really don't like hearing people minimise domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he tried to kill me so many times mm. and it was when I was pregnant with my daughter and I was about six months pregnant and we moved in together when I was four months pregnant and it was a really, not really what I wanted to do at all. I was hoping he would just go away and I could just, you know, raise this child on my own and I had my father in hospital dying at the time Yeah. and he, you know, not going to everything how it came about, but he basically... um yeah, uh, beat me, dragged me by my hair into a walk-in robe and beat me till I was unconscious. And I came to, um, I don't know timing how long it was, but I came to after and ended up in a hospital and nearly lost my unborn child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very, very badly beaten up. And, you know, it was at that moment that I lay there thinking, I surely I can't be the only person going through this. You know, like surely... Mm -hmm. Surely this has got to be like, this just can't be me. This, this is just something just not right. And I just prayed to God. I had all these nurses around me and, and a lot of judgment, a lot of people judging. I remember there's a couple of nurses in tears, a few midwives that were crying, another one that, you know, was just horrible to me. It was, it was really difficult place to be in physically and, and emotionally. But yeah, I just said to God, you know, surely like if you save me from this and, and keep my dad alive long enough for me to go to this other hospital and see him. You know, I'll, I'll I'll do something here. I'll you know utilize me, and I'll do something to make a difference. And that's what God did. <laughs> he saved me uh, that night, and He kept my father alive for probably about another month. And yeah, I did get to see my father and say goodbye. And you know, and look, there were, I, I you know people probably think, how can you just sit there and 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 talk about it? So <laughs> you know, normally mm. it, it's it. I mean, I've spoken about my story for, you know, 16 years to educate and create awareness. Mm -hmm. um, it's never easy. It, you know, it's not easy at all. But if people can understand that, you know, there were times I cried out to God and I blamed God. I absolutely put the blame on God. And I felt so unloved and unprotected and I didn't know God's bigger plan. I didn't know him enough or trust him enough to know mm -hmm. that he would save my unborn child and he would get us out of this situation. Um, I didn't have anyone to turn to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the police would come up and discourage me from going to a refuge because they said it was full of women on drugs and you don't want to be there. That's what one police officer told oh. me. Um, it's not true. It's yeah. completely not yeah. true. So I literally was living then homeless between my vehicle and the place that I was paying rent on where he, the perpetrator was residing as well. And so, you know, I was struggling. I was pregnant, homeless. Um, he would take my phone. He would lock me in the house so I couldn't. I couldn't ring to say I wouldn't be coming into work. I would lose jobs because of him. Um, he took all my money, went through all my money. So when I finally did have my baby and finally was able to find somewhere to move to and leave him, the DV didn't just stop magically. I still had financial abuse. I had his debts on my credit card. Mm. Um, I had to get back to, to work. Um, you know, I had a child to support on my own and I had to start from scratch. But... It was then I believe at that point, I remember the first day I woke up in a new unit, a new apartment that I was renting, you know, away from him and I was just this little unit and I just woke up and went to the kitchen and the sun was shining and it was just beautiful and I thought, I don't have to be afraid today. He's not going to come in and throw my breakfast against the wall like he did every mm. morning. He's not going to come in and hurt me and break everything that I own because I had nothing left. And I was just, I was such a a shell of my former self and you know people look at me today and think oh well you're outspoken or you're confident <laughs> like I was not that person when I went mm -hmm. through DV it was not that person and I was very afraid and I struggled to look people in the eye because he would not let me look people in the face so I was always looking wow. at the ground um yeah it, it was I was so psychologically physically controlled um he had committed physical mental, financial and sexual mm. and emotional against me. So, you know, to then be raising this child and trying to still escape him when I'd left. I mean, he knew where we lived and so the abuse and the stalking went on for about another, you know, two years um, of me wow. having to move a few times with my daughter. Um, throughout all of school, I had to keep her, you know, safe. We were literally 
you know, she couldn't have her real name in school photos because, you know, people would put their whole kids' class photo on on the internet. Yeah, thank you, parents. Um, huh. So, you know, I had to make sure that my daughter's name wasn't – so she started using an alias name and p- kids would go, why Why is your name wrong in the photo? Yeah. You know, and as six and seven and eight, my daughter would have to, to cop that at school and, mm. and you know, we'd have to work out ways and resources and tools – to navigate that path and you know when you leave dv people think it ends dv being domestic violence yeah but you have to have tools in place and these days you know there are dv services that are much better equipped you know with with funding and staffing and resources these days to you know there's even places that do technological checks on vehicles to check that you haven't got a gps track on your car from the perpetrator wow um so a lot yeah there's a lot more these days than than there was for me yeah you know, but for us, I mean, God, God, I, you know, I, I met a girl one day and she's now a chaplain, actually. And she said to me, you know, God's protecting you. He will never let the wolf at your door. And it was so true because God always protected us from him. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and you know, now I've got a young adult. My daughter's a young adult. And, um, you know, but even with social media, with everything, we've always been very wary. Um, her safety's always been my number one priority. And I've heard, correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously... You know, what you've shared, the violence is horrific and traumatizing. Mm. But I've talked to some survivors that said, yes, the violence is terrible, but it's all the other psychological trauma that's very traumatic as well. It's all the words they've said. It's all the control. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to, when you first get out, to understand that you have independence and you have agency over your life again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That takes getting used to and, and acceptance again and you know, kind of making peace with yourself because you go into a lot of self-blame and victim blaming and, mm. and society's attitude, sadly, is still along the line of victim blaming rather than stopping to think about, hello, it's a person who commits the act that needs to be held accountable. Mm, yeah. Um, it, yeah, it, look, it does. It takes time. But, I mean, for me, I think there's layers of, of every aspect of the violence that still show up today for me, you know, especially with you know, the physical trauma that, that I had mm. um, that wasn't fully treated at the time and, you know, um, people say, you know, bones will heal or time heals, you know. Yeah. But um, every, you know, victim survivor, I mean, needs to be looked at individually case by case mm-hmm. because yeah. what affects one person and a lot of that can depend on, you know, their background or the level of support at the time, mm-hmm. you know, opportunities or education they have, what socioeconomic group, their cultural background. There's a whole lot of other factors that can be barriers to their recovery. And so, you know, that again is, you know, we need to look as a society collectively and say, well, how can we better support these groups of, of vulnerable people? Mm-hmm. Now, getting back to your story, again, you said that you kind of made a pact with God that you wanted to be used by him. What happened? <laughs> he took me up on it. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hear. Let that one slip by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He went, okay. All right, this is what I needed from you. <laughs> yeah, so um, look, that was, yeah, when I was obviously pregnant and, um, yeah, had my daughter. And so within probably we moved a couple of times, my daughter and I, and I think she was about two at the time and, and um, literally I somehow wanted to volunteer for an organisation at the time. It was, um, I won't, they'll remain nameless because I don't support what they do. <laughs> a lot mm. of the sector don't support what they do and who they are. And they linked me with Amnesty International and Amnesty were doing, you know, they wanted to do this this sort of presentation at Parliament House in Brisbane and, and um, then I got talking to a wonderful staff member at Amnesty and, yeah, we had some meetings and they just said, look, would you be comfortable sharing part of your story? And so they provided um, a DB advocate to stand by me from DB Connect at the time and I, I swear she was amazing because I blabbered my way crying through most of the, of the mm. talk. I don't know how anyone understood what I'm saying. Um, but we had people there from media, we had senior police and we had some, you know, members of parliament pop in and basically a lot of frontline services were there and they're saying, we never hear this. We never hear someone giving their survival story. We need to mm. hear more about gaps because, you know, as an educated, you know, woman, I appear, you know, I've got a mixed race background. I didn't know at the time about my Indigenous heritage, but, you know, as, as a, a, by appearance, a white woman, who's educated, mm. living in a metropolitan Brisbane, um, you know, I fell through gaps. So how would that be for women with disability, Indigenous women? You know, what other gaps are we not addressing that these people are falling through? And so I continued to do this, you know, unpaid work 
um, of going and educating. They'll be asked to speak at universities, um, which I laughed. I thought was hilarious. I thought I don't have a letter after my name <laughs> at the hmm. time. I, but God was using you. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was like, I'm going to take you there. And, and um, you know, and speaking and addressing media and addressing, you know, members of parliament. Um, I was mentioned in different parliamentarian Hansards um, where, you know, members of parliament, federal and, and state had spoken about me and my work, which was really lovely to be acknowledged, but more so to know that they're talking about that in government. Well, we'll have to stop it right there as we've run out of time for part one of Eric Scatterbo's conversation with Rachel K. Roos, who's sharing the ups and downs of her life journey with us. As we just heard, she went from being in a severely dysfunctional, domestic violence-filled relationship to sharing her story all over Australia with the hopes of preventing others from finding themselves in a similar horrific situation. At her lowest point, she called out to God and he has helped her overcome and be used in remarkable ways. As it says in the Bible, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Also, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, thank you so much for joining us for part one of Rachel K. Ruse's amazing story. We invite you to join us for part two. And until then, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Next time on The Story. People always want me to speak. People always like, come and speak at this, come and speak at that. And it's like, well, you know, I had a young child. I needed a babysitter. I needed to prepare. I had, you know, sometimes up to three other jobs that I was doing to keep a roof over her head and pay the rent. I had that mentality of, you know, I want to save the world. That was who I wanted to be. I just want to save the world because I didn't want any other woman or man or child to go through what I'd gone through. Rachel K. Roos is a survivor of domestic violence and has gone on to share her story across Australia and to write an award-winning educational program. We'll hear more of Rachel's inspiring story next time. The story. story. Just another way vision is helping you look to God daily. This program is a production of Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, see vision.org.au. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.